Welcome to Health Reform 2.0, the only place on the internet for people with a curious mind and a desire for a better health care system. Here we take you on a journey of our current quagmire, tell you where it came from and why the government can't fix it. Along the way, we'll tell you some history, bust a few big myths, tell you a few stories, and give you an idea how we can work together and get the health care system we want. Let's get started. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Health Reform 2.0. We're back again with episode 1.9. We have one more episode to 1.10 after this, and we're looking forward to getting there and uh, so we can start talking about something other than history. But uh, you'll notice in full, uh, full ad- admonition of the truth here, Tim and I are wearing exactly the same clothes. We're sitting in exactly the same spot because... We're just continuing the next episode. We're trying to keep these things down to a reasonable amount of time. And this series here is really going to be three. So we're trying to keep them down and get the last three done pretty well. But, uh, yeah, we're still here. We're still doing it. And uh, we're glad you're back again uh, and look forward to carrying you through the rest of the story here. Um, Tim? Uh, we're we're into 1.9 now, and yep. we're going to be talking about uh, the next period of time. We just completed talking about the early 50s up into about the beginning of 1963, 64. Mm-hmm. So uh, give the audience a little idea of what we're going to talk about today. So thanks, Tom. The This episode is focused on the Kennedy-Johnson era. Mm-hmm. And I think our audience will find this to be a very interesting and educational uh, period of time. Yeah, I remember living it. Uh, how, how could you forget it? But I was pretty young at, at when Kennedy was assassinated. But then we watched the Johnson era unfold. Uh, a lot of meat in there. A lot of things I didn't quite connect the dots on when I was in my youth mm-hmm. growing up. Connected the dots pretty quickly. I started going back and realizing what had happened. Oh, yeah. So this sets the foundation of what we are facing today, more or less, not exactly, there's been more complication to it, but this laid the groundwork for Medicare and Medicaid and some of the things we're seeing today in our healthcare system. It, it did, and, and you know, we, we exist with a lot of issues in our healthcare system today. You and I have talked a little bit in the past episodes about some of the fundamental myths we have. We're gonna yeah. do a session coming up very soon on the myths of healthcare that we exist with today. And this period of time becomes the formulation of another big myth. And and it really starts to happen when we get into the discussion of Lyndon Johnson and his period of time after Kennedy's death, which we're going to pick up in this episode. And we start talking about one of the myths about why we actually have the healthcare system we have today, right. why it was created. And it, it's, it is startling uh, when you really get down to the truth about why this was done. I mean, it's not a... It's not a, a, it meant to be some kind of an aspersion on the things that Johnson did and whether they were for the good or the bad in the long run. That's debatable, and many people can debate it. We're not <clears> here to debate the effectiveness of it. But we are here to, to let you know that, that the prime motivation to some of these things is not what you think they are. So anyway, so what, what else are we talking about here? Good segue. So let's go back to, to, your, to your book, The History and Evolution of Healthcare in America. Quote, the 1950s to the 1960s were an area of slow-growing dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. As the rising generation was encouraged to think critically, Mm -hmm. to investigate, to innovate, and question authority. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I still do that. Me too. A lot. Obviously. The, The distrust and belief in American exceptionalism grew as a result, and this group which had experienced such rapid gains in prosperity without actually experiencing the poverty and the great despair of the Great Depression, as their parents did, Mm -hmm. uh, began to feel their country owed them more, and them even much, much more, end quote. I remember back, you know, my my parents talking about the Great Depression all the time, my my grandparents, Mm -hmm. it was ingrained. Uh, I, I totally questioned authority. We started to investigate but I never felt anybody ever owed me anything. And so when I said sort of in the last episode, that's what I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I share the philosophy with you. I, I, I don't think America owes us anything. I think right. we need to self-actualize. 
But clearly, we're not the majority, nor are we the minority. We're about half of the country at this point, if you look at the political spectrum. Um, in fact, you could argue there's three spectrums here. We have a, a people like us, you have people on the other side of the fence, and then you have people in the middle that don't exactly believe one thing or another. Um, and and it, it's, it's interesting because this dynamic all began in this period of time. This, yep. this dichotomy, this, this break in the cultural relationships of one group to another in America really started right in this period in 1964. Exactly. I have a theory. I think there's also three kinds of people. People that provide energy, people that suck energy, and people that don't give a shit. Yeah. So yeah. that's yeah, I think that's I think that's I, I think that's pretty good pretty good calculation of the world that we live in. Yeah. Exactly. The interesting thing is that if you wait, wait, you know what do you remember the three stooges? Yeah, sure. You know what Curly's philosophy was? I don't remember. If you first you don't succeed, keep on sucking until you do succeed. <laughs> there you go. That was, that was pretty good. I remember those guys. Yeah. yeah. So the good news is, uh, at least, John F. Kennedy recognized this. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his inaugural address, we'll never forget it, he, he, he tried to appeal to reverse this trend. Mm -hmm. And we all remember the quote, ask not what you can do, for, your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. We'll never forget that. Right. Sadly, uh, with his assassination on November 22nd, 1963, um, the genie was out of the bo bottle and could not be put back in. Um, the dejection, dejection, disaffection the nation felt was another blow. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the assassination of JFK. We don't have to go into a lot of discussion about it. It's an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. I could talk about it for a long time. So... Everyone who lived that period that, that was a reasonable age will never forget where they were right that day. Uh, I was in a sixth grade class, Mrs. Scheidler's class, on the third floor of Weber uh, School in Urbana, Illinois. And I'll, I'll never forget that. I'm sure you'll never forget where you were. I was. Uh, I remember specifically when I found out the president had been shot. I had snuck out of uh, class. And uh, in those days, it was cool to have copper taps, which were little copper yep. things that you nailed on the base of your shoe and the, and the heel of your shoe. And you'd get these taps and they would click when you walked. And it was what all the cool people had. And the other thing you would do with taps is you would sneak out when you could. And you'd run down the hall and lift up your heels and slide on these taps <laughs> right. on the polished linoleum floors. Of course, peeling off the layer of wax that yep. they had spent a great deal of time to put on there. And I was actually going down the hall under the excuse to go to the bathroom, sliding down on my taps, just having a great slide. And out of the teacher's lounge door came Mrs. Odd. And Mrs. Odd was crying. And I thought I was deeply in trouble. Sure. And she came up to me and she said, the president has been shot. And uh, I won't say what I said to her. It wouldn't be appropriate. But... Uh, uh, I was highly relieved that I wasn't in trouble, so I hustled myself to the bathroom and went back to class. Yeah, you were thinking you're going to get your snapper whipped again. Yeah, I was pretty close to another little whipper snap there right go. there, I think. Yeah. So we'll never forget this uh, ever. And some other events, I think, that, that, that rocked the nation. This was a big one. Yep. Just a quick question for you. Acted alone or was it a conspiracy? That's the million dollar question, literally. Um, what's his name? Stone, the director? Yeah, it was a yeah. lousy movie. But... Yeah, he's, he's made a lot of money trying to propagate one myth or another. I don't think we're ever going to know if it was a conspiracy or not. You know, for most Americans, it's hard to believe in conspiracy theories. Right. Um, there, there's a quote from FDR we have in the video of our last thing. And FDR often said that if... if uh, if it looks like something the government would never have done, they probably did it. <laughs> True. So it, it's there's so many other undercurrents of things at play. You know, in in any president, you know, you look at Trump today and you see how much hatred there exists for Trump. Right. We think of Kennedy and as in Camelot as a marvelous time in America, and and it's right. a convenient uh, memory because of his, his assassination, and it was a way to help put that aside. 
But there were plenty of people in America that didn't like the Kennedy. Sure. Um, and and there were pe- plenty of people that were scared of him and scared of his brother, Robert, because they were getting ready to shape, shake up the swamp in Washington, D.C. In fact, they were well on their way to shaking up the swamp in Washington, D.C., um, not to propagate a conspiracy theory, but Kennedy was thinking about putting out a federal dollar. And there were a number of people that were concerned about that. Sure. Uh, there's no evidence that he was assassinated as a result of that. They've never been able to tie any motivation to the assassination, which to me has always been one of the one of the things that I have found most interesting in, in it, why why this happened. And no one's ever really been able to address why Oswald shot Kennedy. That's right. Uh, it, it's it just never has rung true. But be that as it may, we're never going to know the we'll answer know. to it. It does make for great coffee table discussions yeah, and nice yeah. arguments with friends and neighbors into the night where you can throw sure. things at each other, scream and yell in a drunken stupor, and yeah. then walk home later. Yeah. Thank God yeah. for alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> and so many events of the 1960s plagued America, but none more than the Vietnam War. Right. We know that. We, right. we saw what happened, and it was a horrible situation. Exactly. Um, this endpoint began a generation through the 1970s where many believe you cannot trust anybody you know, over the age of 30. Today, I don't trust anybody under the age of 50. It's amazing what uh, a lifetime of experience does for you, isn't it? It really does. <laughs> and, and these protests, this insurrection uh, led to a great deal of unhappiness and, and lack of prosperity, mm-hmm. in my opinion. So one of the things that came about at this time in 1964 was the Hughes Act. Can you mm-hmm. explain what the Hughes Act was, Tom? Yeah. So it, it, the Hughes Act really came about as a result of television. Um, it, it, it's television brought uh, the ability in the early 60s for ideas to take root in America that may or may not have taken root in politics before that period. So in 1946, there was a gentleman named Harold Hughes, and he was a self-described college dropout (laughs) and drunk with a jail record. Uh, He was facing a sanity commission that was brought by his wife, who wanted to divorce him, uh, to show cause on why he shouldn't be committed to the state's insane asylum as an inebriant. So remember that term inebriant from the 1890s into the 1940s. Hughes had been to war. He was a combat rifleman during World War II, and he barely escaped being killed. In fact, he he had such a bad reaction to war that he got court-martialed for assaulting an officer. Uh, So clearly, Harold Hughes was not a pillar in his community. He wasn't someone that that, uh, everybody was flocking to to learn things out about uh, how to become somebody. he was drinking out of control. And in 1952, Harold Hughes was desperate and he got suicidal. In his book, Hughes describes how he got his shotgun, climbed into his bathtub, ready to get off of the alcohol crazy train by blowing his brains out against the wall. Then something amazing happened, a miracle. In a moment of spiritual enlightenment, Hughes' life was changed. He embraced a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, and he even started his own AA group in his town. Harold Hughes went on to become a much beloved politician. Mm -hmm. Again, something that sounds kind of familiar. Mm -hmm. He started as governor of Ohio from 1962 to 1968, and then he became an Iowa senator. And he was known affectionately in the Senate as Mr. Addiction. Mm -hmm. Uh, He pushed through the 1970 Hughes Acts, creating the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. That's NIAAA. And NIAAA is still in effect today. And with it comes this year a $482 million budget. In fact, I have their, their, uh, their annual appropriation Uh, request for budget this year. The interesting thing about that is some would wonder if the cost of this agency is still worth it. Half a billion dollars uh, worth of money being spent. Is it really worth it with alcohol being in the state it is today? Alcohol is clearly still a problem, um, but it is less of a problem than it was in the 1960s. 
And of course, we're now bringing cannabis back into the marketplace. But, you know, if you compare addiction today and you compare the issue of what it was in the 1950s, no one can doubt that the Hughes Acts had a positive effect. But they've got a half a billion dollar budget and they have about 285 sure. employees that exist. And, and if you want to go online and download this, you should do this for any agency in the United States, frankly. They're all online. If you go down and look at this and look at where they're spending money, you'll see some things that you can agree with. There's a number of things that we're spending money on that I think everybody in America is going to agree. But there are some programs in here as well that you would want to think twice about whether they make sense to spend part of the money that we have to, to deal with health care. This is a health care program. But some of these things are things in there that people in America, once they're educated, may determine is perfectly acceptable or might be better spent elsewhere. And it really illustrates the point that television is the people's media really helped get this bill passed. It started early. Uh, this, this push started early and culminated in the 70s, as we said. Um, and what we have today in the people's media is television we are soon going mm -hmm. to have in the Internet. And we'll talk about that as we get into the, the last episode of this, I think. But um, the Hughes Act set the stage for trying to deal with alcoholism. It was a big thing that was a push that started to really happen in the early 60s as Johnson took office. It did. So, Tom, the uh, change in people's attitude, the culture, people expecting things from the government, wanting more, as any good politician would take advantage of, LBJ uh, it prompted his great society. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were identified as initiatives to provide for social reform and eliminate radical injustice. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> really. From this guy? Yeah, from Johnson. I mean, yeah. radical injustice and in lies that he perpetuated throughout his presidency. I remember them like yesterday. Yep. The Gulf of Tonkin. Yeah, we all that's a complete yeah. fabrication of lie. And we only found that out a couple of years ago. Yeah, we have the evidence. Yeah. I mean, he's quoted as saying, I think maybe they were just shooting, or I don't even care if they were shooting a bunch of whales out there. And what did that do? It escalated the war significantly. Thank God for the Johnson tapes. Yeah. We're going to talk about them in a minute. So there was other things that occurred that time, and we won't get into, into the detail, but the way he executed that uh, war was ridiculous. Uh, frightening, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, Johnson presidency, if you give us a little bit of background on it. And by the way, I saw right through this guy, even when I was, you know, I was in my teens. I never trusted this guy. There was something wrong about him. I never liked him. Uh, I couldn't stand him. And he picked his dogs up by the ears. So how can you trust somebody that picks the dogs up by the ears? Full-grown dog. Yeah, He's an idiot. But um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about uh, President Johnson. Well, it, it, as we've talked about before, the history of the United States is not all standing and beginning in whole cloth. It, it starts, <clears throat> many of the things we saw with Johnson actually had their roots back in an earlier period of time. In the case of the, the new, going from the New Deal into the Great Society with Johnson from, from FDR's New Deal, they had their roots in Herbert Hoover's campaign for president in 1928. Mm -hmm. And Herbert Hoover ran on the promise of a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Now, Hoover knew he couldn't get everybody a chicken and give everybody a car. Mm -hmm. um, it was just something to tell the American people so that he would convince them he was going to give them more than the other guy, free stuff, and they would elect him. Um, and... It, it, the problem is then FDR took what Hoover did and brought that forth in the New Deal. Now, there were legitimate reasons for the, the fundaments of the New Deal. There were real issues that they were trying to solve for. But, you know, it, it don't think for a minute that there wasn't a political agenda, even with FDR, who had his hands full with a lot of things. But he also wanted to get reelected and he wanted to, to, to increase the power and and. Uh, and longevity of his own political party. And, and the, the problem was, is through the New Deal all the way up into the 1960s, this kind of attitude of free stuff started to include a lot of things that people now quote unquote needed. And, and it wasn't just chickens, but it was not one car, but two cars. 
it was televisions. People should have a TV because if we get you a TV, you can hear more and more what we're trying to sell you. Um, and, and there were many other free things that, that they wanted to get or, or the government wanted you to get. Later, it becomes credit cards for a variety of reasons. Uh, today, can one, one can say that at some point it got to where it becomes we want to get some pot with every chicken today. I mean, that's that's where we're at at this point in time. Did you ever get your free Obama phone a few years ago? I didn't. Never got my free Obama phone. phone. Although it isn't a few years ago, they still are giving out it's free still, phones if you want, want them. Once something gets established, yeah. you can't get rid of it's, it. It's hard to get rid of that stuff. So free <laughs> stuff is still with us today like the phone. And right. the expansion of the Social Security Act of 1935, which is what <clears throat> Medicare and Medicaid are, they, they, they didn't become a standalone bill. They were expansions of the 1933 Act. And it, it, this set the stage for a series of things that put us in the conundrum we exist today with health care. And they really put a nail in the coffin of the government ever being able to effectively fix this. And again, like many things, it's not for the reasons that we think. Uh, the government can't fix it because, number one, they can't deal with the economics of it. We cannot continue to pay for it. This becomes painfully clear in a few minutes. Uh, but the second thing is, is that we've now built a professional political class who gets elected because they tell us they're giving us free stuff. They, and, and Or they tell us that we're going to get it, but somebody else is going to pay for it. The evil rich people over here or this other evil class of people over there is going to take care of it. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have the problem, so we're going to figure out how to make them pay. It, it's, it's really been a philosophy that started to really get inculcated in Johnson's era. And this isn't coming as Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal. We're not identifying the motivations. We're just talking about it. You, you will see in a little while in the next episode, we're going to talk about the economics of our structure in the 70s and into the 80s and how the economics of the U.S., and the increase in costs in the U.S. from a number of programs, not just Medicare and Medicaid, really took its toll. And, and it is not one party's fault. We'll show you a chart, if you watch the video, that will show you that, that it doesn't make a difference whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, that the problems in the economy continued unabated. There was little to nothing that actually ever fundamentally changed the, the, the trend line our economy is on. We can look at individual periods of time and we compare Bush to, to Clinton or cl compare Clinton to Reagan. And we have all these great little things in this short, compressed time that say it looks good. When you look across the entirety from 1900, it has not gotten good ever. It's just gotten worse. So this free stuff has built up and caused a problem. And primarily, FDR's America, uh, you know, really developed the expansion of these things to, to deliver to us the things that we think we need. But in the end, they haven't done that. No, they haven't. And nothing's free. And all these things work great until you run out of OPM. Other people's other money. Other people's money. You betcha. And that's where we're at. So from the, again, the quote from your book, quote, one of the longest standing debates uh, about health care is based on a lack of agreement on where government benefits should end and mm -hmm. per personal responsibility should begin. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a major debate. Yep. You know, from Teddy Roosevelt to Truman, the debate, the debate was never about the provision of free government paid health care. It was about access to quality health care. Right. But that shifted in 1965 era where it moved towards the government provision of insurance through an expanded Social Security Act of 1935, and again revised in 1965. Right. And I think from one of the quotes that I read, I think Mayor Johnson's quotes, we're going to hear about it when we probably bring up the Mills tape. Mm -hmm. I think the, the thing was, care for the sick, serenity for the fearful. It was a great political slogan. Right. Almost as good as a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. So there was an election in 1964 that President Johnson won by a landslide. I remember it. Uh, and he felt coming out of that, he had a clear mandate, and he pushed for the Medicare uh, and Medicaid uh, as one of his primary goals. Right. You know. So let's talk a little bit about Medicare, how it came to be, 
uh, about and the importance of a very important person in this whole process, a congressman by the name of Wilbur Mills. Wilbur and, Mills. And a very famous recorded telephone conversation between Congressman Wilbur Mills and President Lyndon Johnson. Yep. Well, Wilbur Mills was, uh, was a very smart guy. He had served in Congress for a long time. Um, he had significant doubts about the, the ability of the nation's tax system to continue to fund Social Security, let alone Medicare and Medicaid. Right. Um, there's a book by a guy named Robert Helms. It's called The Origins of Medicare, if you're interested in more information. But in the book, Robert Helms writes, even in the face of strong political pressure from other Democrats, Mills had been so consistent in his opposition to adding a medical benefit to Social Security that many suspected him of being sympathetic to the AMA's socialized medicine arguments. He used his detailed knowledge of Social Security to question both the Kennedy and Johnson's administration's cost estimates as, and to point out that estimating future medical costs was a much more difficult task than estimating the future cost of a cash benefit. In 1964, Mills said, in practical terms, this means that if the hospital insurance system, which would be created by the bill, was to remain sound, the taxable wage base would have to be increased by $150 each year. Clearly, this would be the case of the tail wagging the dog. Therefore, the taxable base wage increased an average of $46 per year from 1959 to 1964. In the same speech, Mills pointed out that the hospital costs were increasing at a rate of 6.7%, while average earnings were increasing at only 4%. That's 1955 to 1963. And that, he, that Mills saw no reason to assume that the situation was going to change. His support for the final version of Medicare in 1965 was apparently due to the effect of the Democratic gains in the House in the elections in 1964. President Johnson's personal appeals for support and the many technical changes that he was able to insert into the bill during its various stages of development. From the research, it was clear that in the beginning he was very opposed to this expansion. Well, but he was the one that actually pushed it through. So what changed so dramatically? Well, the landslide election of Johnson and the Democratic Congress in 1964, Wilbur Mills saw the writing was on the wall, and he knew he either had to get on the bus and join this momentum, or he was going to find himself going back home and pushed out of office. He also felt that if he carried the bill forward, as, as Helm said, he would be able to get some things in there that would minimize the negative impact that the bill might have, the legislation would have, if he could change, effectively change it. And it would might buy them time with the bill to make some fundamental changes later after the, after the novelty and the excitement of this new bill wore off, this new, new benefit to America. Uh, unfortunately, the changes that he wanted to make never happened. In fact, over the next few years, we enhanced and extended Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so the, ultimately, he realized that the legislation itself wasn't necessarily going to be good for the country, but the legislation was going to be exceedingly good for the Democratic Party. And that is the prime reason that he got behind it. There's a phone conversation you alluded to that occurs between Wilbur Mills and Lyndon Johnson on March 23, 1965. It also has Carl Albert and a guy named Wilbur Cohen. And they were on the House Ways and Means Committee. And this call took place right after the closing vote of the Ways and Means Committee to approve Medicare and Medicaid to push to the floor for a vote to get approval of Congress so Johnson could have his bill. So let's take a moment and listen to the, to the recording. Speaker of the House John McCormick calls Lyndon Johnson. Hello. Yes, Mr. Speaker. They Hello. told me that you and Carl wanted to talk to me. Yeah, we got the Wilbur Mills here, Wilbur Cohen. Well, uh, here's Wilbur. You want to talk with Wilbur Mills? All right. Wait a minute, Mr. 
Wilbur Mills, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, reports to President Johnson. That's President. Hi, Wilbur. How are you doing? Fine. Good to hear from you. We uh, wound up and I got instructions. We'll introduce the bill at noon tomorrow and report it at 12.15. Be very briefly doing so. Uh, I wanted to let Wilbur coin, if you would take a minute, to give you his reaction to it. Fine, I, I think we've got you something that we won't only run on in 66, but we'll run on from the hereafter. Wonderful. Thank you, Wilbur. Now, here's Wilbur coin. When are you going to take it up? With, uh, I've got to go to the rules committee next week. You uh, you always get your rules pretty quick, though. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we could have it on late next week, probably. Thank you. Thank not you. early in the following week. God's sake, let's get it for Easter. Oh, I, what they do oh, is no doubt about that. It's going what to they do, what they do, and you've got two or three little measures that uh, you might not take too long on uh, uh, that give us trouble. They make a poll every Easter. They've been doing it for 30 years. You know it. And what has accomplished it, Congress accomplished up to then. And the rest of the year, they use that record to write editorials about. So anything that we can grind through before Easter will be twice as important as after Easter. So much obliged, much obliged to you. Wilbur Cohen, architect of Medicare and Medicaid, reports to the president. Is that right? Yes, sir. I think you got uh, not only uh, everything that you wanted, but we got a lot more than uh, uh, on this uh, thing. It's a real comprehensive bill. What? Uh, how much does it cost my budget over what we estimate? Well, I think it uh, it would be around, I'd say, four hundred and fifty million more. Uh, than what you estimated uh, for the net cost of this supplementary program. What do they do under that? How is that handled? Explain that to me again, over and above the King Anderson, the supplementary you stole from Burns. Yes. Well, uh, generally speaking, it's uh, physician services. Physician? Yes, in the office. All right, now my doctor that I go out and he pumps my stomach out to see if I got any ulcers, that physician? That's right. Uh, any, any medical services that are MD services? Any MD services. Now, uh, All right. Now, how do we know? What Does he charge what he wants to? No, uh, he can't quite charge what he wants to be, because uh, this has been put in a separate, uh, a separate fund. Yeah. And uh, what the secretary of HEW would have to do is make some kind of agreement with uh, somebody like Blue Shield, yeah. well, let's say. And it would be their responsibility, uh, under the way the chairman has provided the bill, that they would regulate the fees of, uh, in effect, of the doctor. Uh, because uh, what he tried to do is to be sure that the government wasn't regulating the fees directly. That's just deal with the individual doctor. And uh, the bill provides that the doctor could only charge the reasonable charges, but this intermediary, the Blue Shield, uh, would have to do all the policing so that the government wouldn't have its long hands. All right, that's good. Now, what does it do for you, the patient, on, on doctors? It says that uh, you can uh, have doctor's bills paid up to what extent or how much or uh, any limit? The individual patient has to pay the first $50 all right. deductible, all right. and then he's got to pay 20%. Of everything after that? Everything after that. So if you went to the doctor and you had a $1,000 bill, you paid the first $50, and for the other $950, you'd have to pay 20% of that. Oh, uh, but that keeps your hypochondriacs out. That keeps stuff. the hypochondriacs out. At the same time, uh, for most of the people, uh, uh, it would uh, provide an uh, overwhelming proportion of their uh, their physician's cost. Yes, sir, and it's not something that nearly everybody could endure. They could borrow that much, or, or their folks could get them that much to pay their part, and even if they didn't have any money. Now, uh, what does it get you on hospital and nurses' home under the King Anderson? Well, under the King Anderson card, you get the uh, first 60 days of your hospital care yeah. with a $40 deductible. Yeah, right. 40, finally compromised on 40 uh, That's good. That's good. And uh, then, in addition, it has the three other benefits that were in your bill, namely the home health services, uh, the outpatient diagnostic, and we fixed that amendment up the way, uh, you remember the, uh, remember yeah, the way yeah, uh, the Mayo yeah, Brothers yeah, talked yeah. to you and me about 
And then the only one change was for the uh, home health services. That has to be after you get out of the hospital. That's good. All right. Now, uh, what are the insurance companies? Are they still raising hell? Well, Man? yes, I think they're going to go over to the Senate and raise uh, hell uh, on uh, thing, because quite, uh, quite frankly, uh, there's no longer any room for the private insurance companies to sell insurance policies for people over 65 when you take the combination of hospital care and the uh, physician service. Yeah, okay, now, I think that's wonderful. Now, remember this, nine out of ten things that I get in trouble on is because they lay around. And tell the speaker and Wilbur to please get a rule just the moment they can. They want to get. And, they want to bring it up next week, Mr. Yeah, President. but you just tell them not to let it lay around. Do that. They want to, but they might not. Then that gets the doctors organized. Then they get the others organized, and I damn near kill my education bill letting it lay around. Yeah. It stinks. It's yeah. just like a dead cat on the door when a committee reports that you better either bury that cat or get it some life. And the speaker is saying to me, he says he's way ahead of you, Mr. Right. President. He's going to get that right. on the house calendar next week and right. get it going right. so the, the doctors Well, can. congratulations, Steve. Now, let me talk to Carl if he's there. All right. Thank you. Majority Leader Carl Albert. Yes, sir. How's the little John? All right, I think they've told you the whole story. Well, that's mighty good. You're mighty wonderful. All right. Uh, get them, uh, uh, Carl, get them to, uh, to make y'all, y'all talk to John, y'all talk to uh, old man Smith, and make him not let this stuff lay around until they can generate opposition to us. All right. Yes, sir. Just a minute. We'll, we'll start with right. Mr. Right. Mills. Chairman Mills. Mr. President, don't you worry one minute about these uh, doctors and insurance companies organizing against this bill. Yeah. Uh, now, we have written the insurance people, I, am, I must admit, completely out of the field yeah. of people over 65. Yeah. But the AMA is going in all directions. Yeah. I have even had them, uh, just in confidence, come to me at the last minute telling me they would accept the payroll tax if we'd use it uh, to finance our program with the state administering it. Uh, well, you couldn't have that. No. But they've come a long, long way, and they're going in all directions. Now, the insurance people uh, are going to oppose it. There's no doubt about that. They were going to oppose H.R. 1. They were going to oppose anything we did. But they've got no more to oppose with respect to what we've got in this bill than they would have fought for anyway without what we've done. The only thing I don't, the only thing I'm concerned about, and I'm very frank about it, is that there's about $450 million in this bill out of the general funds of the Treasury for which you haven't budgeted to your, uh, your uh, situation. Uh, yeah, but I, I'll take care of that. I'll do that. You see what I've done. Uh, Wilbur, uh, uh, see, this will not hold for the rest of the year, but the first eight months, by constant cabinet pressure, by withholding and just threatening and ultimatum and being meaner than you or Harry Bird, I am under this year, the first eight months, a billion eight hundred million under what you appropriated and what I said I'd spend. Now, uh, I I think that I'll at least get down to where, where I'll be four or five hundred million under that. That's number one. Number two, my deficit in the budget I sent you in January is a billion dollars under my deficit last year. And uh, uh, I, I've reduced the deficit, $1 billion. Now, I think that uh, we can, uh, uh, when they asked me about, uh, said, you want to put in four or $500 million. Uh, what did I say about it? I said, well, you tell him we had an old judge in Texas one time. We called him Al Cowley, old Al Cowley Roberts. And he said, when they talked to him one time, and I might have used the Constitution, he said, well, what's the Constitution between friends? And I say, tell Wilbur that $400 million is not going to separate us friends when it's for health, when it's for sickness, because there's a, it's a greater demand, and I know it, and for this bill than all my other programs put together. And I know that, but it'll last longer. Mr. President, if you would talk to Mr. Ackley and also to Mr. Gordon, uh, they came to see me. And I, too, was concerned about the impact of the tax beginning. Uh, yeah, they, 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 we are worried about that because it takes so much. We minimized the concern that they had initially. We revised our rates. 
uh, more in keeping with uh, their views, and I think they're completely satisfied. Uh, what they wanted me to do, most of the spenders uh, said that I was not putting enough money in the economy, and I'd have to put three or four billion in to accelerate public works and other things, and I'd cut down. Now they come along and they say, well, you're taking a lot more out here now, and you're not pumping anything back, you're going to get in trouble. I said, well, you all go see me as yourself and talk to them and find some agreement, and I'm willing to go on and think that you all going. We've agreed and we've changed the bill. Out of That's good. Uh, they're lying out of Well, I'll get out a statement and, and we'll congratulate the committee and congratulate you. And for God's sakes, don't let dead cats stand on your porch. Mr. Rayburn, you say they stunk and they stunk and they stunk. When you get one out of that committee, I'm you call that son of a bitch up before they get can get their letters written. You know that. I, I sure do. I know where you learned it. We'll be right. Right. Let me talk to the speaker now. Yeah, all right, here's the speaker. Thank you, sir. Well, that's mighty good. Now, don't you let that dead cat hang around. Make them give you a rule. Because Mr. Rayburn, you said a dead cat got out of the committee report. It started stinking every day. And let's get it passed before they can get the letters in. And we'll we'll have a damn good record. Because that sounds like a better bill, John, than we sent you. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't, it, doesn't it to you? It does to me, yeah. I told them $250 million, uh, You know, my philosophy and yours, you and I never argued about $450 million for people over 65, did we? No. By the way, you better these are <laughs> Okay, my friend. All right, Mr. friend. Well, John, John. So clearly, if you listen to the recording, you've heard that it wasn't Wilbur Mills calling Lyndon Johnson with Wilbur Cohen and Carl Albert, the Speaker of the House, to say, hey, we just did something great for the American people. Hey, this is just the greatest thing since sliced bread. We're really going to help America get all the health care they need. Right. We're going to make an improved group of people that are going to work better and feel better and be happier. It was all about political gain. His, his opening line to, to Johnson, as you just heard, was, I'm going to give you something that's going to get us elected in the next election and the election after that and the election after that. This was a political Gain. It was a political maneuver. And Wilbur Mills and, frankly, most people, including Johnson, knew that the country could ill afford Social Security any longer, nor Medicaid and Medicare. But they wanted to get in the point to get reelected, and they thought over time they'd be able to fix everything so it would just work out. And this is a trend line we've had since all the way back in the early 1900s when it came to the political address of healthcare in America. Right. We're just going to do something now. We don't care what it is. And somewhere down the, the line, we'll change it and make it better. And the problem is they never change. Social Security, remember, was supposed to be replaced with a private annuity by 1949. And Congress in 1949 was supposed to go back to a part-time Congress. Of course, now we know that in 1949, Social Security became permanent, yep. and we now have this professional political class who no longer makes their living by working in the community of their mm -hmm. constituents. They make their living by being professional politicians, and they get their money by getting voted back into office and selling our vote back to us. They do. So it, that's the nature of part of the problem we have today. It's a major problem, and we're going to get more into that in the next, because I can't wait to get to the day. Yeah. And, and one other point. This is, we're talking about Democrats now, but yeah. the Republicans have just, done the same thing. They're all the same. This, this, is, this is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. Frankly, it is an American people issue because we are the ones that have allowed ourselves to be sucked into this quagmire over and over again because we believe that yeah. somehow there's a free lunch. I truly believe there's not much difference between a Republican and a Democrat. Yeah. I'm neither. I, I agree. And... and and I believe right now we're just run by a bunch of oligarchs, but that's another another assumption that we'll get into at some other time. Right. Uh, I know there's another point. Here comes the AMA again. I know they were opposed to this. Desperately opposed to it because they recognized fundamentally it was not going to be good in the long run for doctors. Yep. Yeah. And they even had an uh, operation uh, to try to squash this thing. What was it called, Tom? They had Operation Coffee Cup. And Operation mm -hmm. Coffee Cup was an AMA campaign in the late 1950s into 1960s, focused on at, at, at going after any form of government insurance and government health care system, and, and, and the, the idea to extend Social Security for the elderly, now known as Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, doctors' wives 
uh, at the behest of the AMA, would organize meetings in order to convince more people like them to write letters to Congress to oppose the program. Uh, Ronald Reagan was actually uh, a strong supporter of Operation Coffee Cup, who in 1961 produced an LP record to be played at these meetings called Ronald Reagan Speaks Out Against Socialized Medicine for the AMA, outlining the main arguments against what he called socialized medicine. Uh, So concerned were many over the political cost of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, Ronald Reagan, on behalf of the AMA, said in a speech in 1961 as part of this Operation Coffee Cup, if you don't stop Medicare and I don't do it, one of these days you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it used to be like back in America when men were free. So Operation yes. Coffee Cup was the AMA's push to try and stop this legislation. Of course, it, it failed. It failed. So you could start seeing the demise of the AMA and it continues to uh, still be a voice, as you mentioned, but really is not doing a whole lot of good for yeah. its constituents. No. No. <clears throat> so since its inception in 1965, Medicare has had an ex- a number of expansions, including one signed by Ronald Reagan. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the interesting piece about that, and we'll get into the next episode, is that brought on DRGs, which we'll get into a lot. In 1964, the, the Medicare system covered about 19 million lives at a cost of $10 billion. Uh, in, 19, in 2004, about 244 million lives at a cost of $1.2 trillion. Put the dollars in the parking lot And you're not a including minute. Medicaid. That's right. Yeah. So or put, the Children's Health Initiative. Or yes. Or a dozen children. other add-on bills that have been pushed into yep. this. So put the numbers in the parking lot because we've already talked about it before. But these numbers right. aren't real. Right. And we'll go back into that at a later, at a later date. But it, you can see the expansion regardless of the numbers. Right. You can see the percentage of growth. So we're going to have a lot more concerning Medicare going forward next episode. Uh, as this new entitlement paved the way for an out-of-control medical industrial complex. Exactly. And that's the term that does exist, ladies and gentlemen. And it is, it is much larger than what we commonly refer to as the uh, as our military industrial complex. And it is, gonna... and it has more uh, innate, rampant waste, fraud, and abuse that are built into the system. And we'll talk about that later. But there is little incentive for nonprofits or for profits to carve out abuse, fraud, duplicated services, and the things that run the bills up. And the reason is the more money that's flowing into healthcare, the more money they're able to pull out of it. Right. So it, it's, it is something that during my time in public health uh, was astounding to me to work with these nonprofits and talk to them about ways to cut back on duplicated services of patients that had just been seen somewhere else, to have them sit and stare at me in the face and say, why do we want to do that? It, when we see these people, we get billable hours, we get paid. You know, we need to see people. Uh, And this is the same group that now is saying they need more physicians and more facilities because they don't have enough people to treat the patients that are there. The reality is if we eliminated the duplicated treatments for patients, uh, we would cut 40 cents out of the healthcare dollar and free 25 to 40 percent of the time that physicians have, particularly in public health sectors, dealing with patients that somebody two weeks ago saw down the street. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of this, and I'm anxious to get into it because we, I, I live it, we see it. This, this waste, fraud, and abuse is massive. Mm-hmm. And, and from uh, Maggie Marr's book, Money Driven Medicine, from all the research that was done uh, in pre- preparation for that book and what was experienced and, and explained in that book, you can easily say, and I think your number is probably even more accurate, that over 50 percent of every health care do- dollar spent is wasted. 60. 60, 60 percent. percent. And it, it breaks out in, in, uh, in, into 20 cents in terms of fraud and abuse and 40 cents in, in waste and duplication of services. Not waste in administrative waste, waste in people paying for the same service twice through two different insurance companies um, and, and doctors 
doing repeating things over and over again that really one could have done. Right. Uh, th this duplicated service issue and medical uh, and malpractice uh, defensive medicine, those things. This is a huge issue in healthcare, um, and it has come through all of these little dumb decisions we've made going back to 1900. And it's put us in a place where when we get to chapter 10, we'll put the icing on this cake, our next chapter. But this is really the, the, the culmination of why healthcare is a mess, why the government can't fix it, and how we, the people, can start to build a system ourselves to fix it. We can build it from within the industry. Mm -hmm. We can define, we, the people, not the politicians, can define an effective role for government. We can define effective role for the state, an effective role for the federal government. We shouldn't have the fox in the hen house telling us what to do. We should have an organization within the country that tells the politicians what it is that they should do to have an effective health care system. They can't get there from here. They can't get there. Right. And this will not be resolved unless we take the stance and fix it ourselves. Exactly. So we're coming to the end of the history series. Our next episode will be episode 1.10. That's going to conclude the history, and then we will begin to move forward with kind of a, a modern view of where things are and, and at the same time talk about various things about the myths that we're facing and how we can destroy the myths, really start to understand what healthcare can deliver, and then what we can do to start to build a system that's going to work for America. That's really why we've taken this historical journey, because it, as hard as it is to believe, if you don't understand where we came from, and why we made those decisions. Talking about some of these changes that we're getting ready to talk about making, A, becomes hard to understand, and B, becomes easy to not understand when someone starts telling you why it's a big problem to make these changes. But once you understand these little inner things here, why one thing doesn't beget another, then these changes start to make sense. And at the end, we get an effective system that will be good for everybody. Good for the patients, what we want to call participants, good for the providers of care. They'll figure out how they can make money where they want to or where they can and how they can provide good, effective services that people need when they need it. For the sponsors, the people that pay the bill, like insurance companies, the government, states, nonprofits, philanthropists, companies, volunteers, whatever, we can coordinate those things so we reduce <laughs> this duplicated services and start to capture the fraud and abuse a little bit. And we can create a role for people that can help you and I figure our way through this quag quagmire as we get to the system we need, a role called a facilitator that currently today is, is no def definition in the healthcare system. And unless they're a nurse working for your doctor or they're a social worker working in a program delivering you care, uh, your friends and family don't really integrate well into the system because of laws like HIPAA that functionally make it difficult for a doctor to share with you information. So it, it's, we're getting to the point where we can get to where we want. We appreciate you paying attention for the series, and, and we think you're really going to like the last episode. We hope you like this one. We are looking forward to this last episode, and, and uh, again, thank you so much for, for coming on this journey with us, and we hope you're getting value out of it. Remember, we, if you want to ask a question, if you're interested in a subject <coughs> that, that we want to know more about, send us a letter at info at hr-20.com and we'll be glad to reply to you and tell you a little bit about how to do this and, and we'll make a show about it. So anything you want to say, Tim? No, I think you summed it up. There's a lot to talk about. I just want to leave it at this. When we're going to go forward. We're going to close out the history lesson. Then we're going to talk about what's going on. You're going to be shocked with some of the things we're going to tell you. To Tom's point, the only way this gets fixed is we put ourselves you, me, you, in the center of our healthcare universe and not on the outside looking in. Until that happens, it's more of the same. Let's get rid of patients, let's all become participants, and let's start to fix the healthcare system from within inside the people that need it. It's us, we, the American people. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. You've been listening to Health Reform 2.0 with your host Tom Loker and Tim Henning. We hope you found the topics interesting, that we answered a few questions, that you laughed a bit, and were entertained. Please feel free to invite your friends to join the discussion, and remember, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Send us your questions to info at hr-20.com. We hope to see you again next time.